Professor Nathan Lent studied biology at St. Louis University and then completed his PhD at St. Louis University School of Medicine in pharmacological and physiological sciences. Now, PhDs need residencies too, so he did his postdoctoral training in cancer genomics at NYU and loved New York so much that he stayed and is now a professor at John Jay College in Manhattan and the director of the Honors Program. His book, Human Errors, A Panorama of Our Glitches from Pointless Bones to Broken Genes, discusses the beauty in our flaws. We are not the well-oiled machines that we think we are. This is part three out of three of my interview with Professor Lentz. For the orthopods out there, we discuss how the wrist and ankles developed in such a nonsensical way. I've heard him describe it as obnoxious, and why standing upright causes problems from herniated discs to all the way to ACL tears. And for the OBs, we discuss reproduction and why infant mortality is so high. Our ability to procreate is so inefficient. And if we are already so inefficient, how menopause can actually be advantageous for natural selection. He maintains the Human Evolution blog, and his podcast is called This World of Humans. He can be found at NathanLentz.com. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. This episode is brought to you by Orange County Bookkeepers Healthcare Accounting, an all-in-one accounting firm for small healthcare businesses and private medical practices. One thing that I personally love about OCB accountants is that they are QuickBook professionals with over 20 years' experience, focusing specifically on healthcare. They utilize a tailored approach individualized to your needs. They're a full-service bookkeeping firm specializing in accounting, payroll, taxes, and financial planning. And for our listeners, for a limited time, they are offering 25% off their services for the first three months. You can visit them at ocbmed.com, that's O-C-B-M-E-D, or call at 833-671-3873 or 949-215-6200. And check out the show notes for more information. Okay, so we have equal inefficiencies in, in other, other specialties, and I love your description of the human hand. So mm-hmm. let's talk about how evolution has, uh, has allowed orthopedic surgeons to thrive as a specialty. Right. Well, I, I'm more thinking of the wrist. I mean, the wrist seems to me like a really funny uh, arrangement because you have these bones, all these little bones in there, the carpals, and what function do they really serve separate from one another? The fact that there are seven sort of crammed in there. You know, if you were to design a robot, for example, with a joint something like our wrist, there's no way that you would put all of these independent parts together. And they're mostly um, fused to each other in the sense that they don't move relative to one another. So what's the point? The point is that there's an evolutionary legacy there. And that that arrangement in all of the limbs of our ancestors were, was very similar in terms of the numbers of bone and their relative positions to each other. But we would not design a joint like that today. And in fact, the the similarity to our ankle and our wrist, despite them performing almost entirely different jobs, harkens back to that shared ancestral history because our four limited ancestors really did use all their limbs in very similar ways, but we don't, but yet we have that, that sort of parallel anatomy and the wrist has weird constraints. I mean, if you try to like twist it around while, while bending it, you know, it doesn't really work nearly as well. And, and the ankle is even more rigid, but of course that's a good thing. We want a rigid ankle and we have so much power that we can drive from our, our big toe and, and, and so forth. I mean, they, they really have evolved well. They just, didn't fix every problem along the way. That's sort of the the theme of it. Yeah, if you were to design them de novo, you would not do it this way. Right, there's no animal whose whose anatomy is perfectly designed uh, for how it lives. And and any engineer could have a a field day redesigning the the skeleton of almost any creature. But that's not how evolution works. It doesn't work with a foreplan, and it certainly doesn't create new structures de novo. It really takes what's there and makes tweaks and tugs. I mean, even the bones of our middle ear you know, grew out of 
pharyngeal <laughs> bones previously in, in, in our reptile ancestors. So we have to take something and retool it. We don't really invent new structures. And what that means is you're stuck with the constraints because it's not just that you're stuck with what you have. Every step of the way has to at least offer a, a, a non-disadvantage, but it really every step really needs to be advantageous in order to get fully formed something in the future. So you can't start evolving a structure in the hope that one day it will be useful. That, that's just not how evolution works. So if we wanted to grow wings, for example, we're not just going to sprout new structures out of our back. Wouldn't that be great? Because then we'd still have our forelimbs when they finally got around to being finished. But that's not how it works, right? You have to, you have to co-opt the anatomy that you already have. So the three times that wings have evolved in, in uh, vertebrates, all three cases, they lost their forelimbs in the process. So birds, pterosaurs, and bats, none of them really can grasp. They can't, there's so much functionality with their forelimbs that they lost in the process of evolving those into wings. So evolution always just has to work with the anatomy that you have and slight advantage overcomes a slight disadvantage, hopefully. And, and that's really, that's how you get directionality to it. So it sounds like the, the wrists and ankles could have been done better, but they're nonetheless still pretty efficient. Whereas walking upright seems to mm-hmm. be, seems to have created a, a significant hurdle from us because it, it's, it's almost like a domino effect, right? It doesn't just affect your back. Right. I think the back, I think our lower back is really the biggest problem with walking upright in terms of sort of incomplete evolution. If you look at the vertebral column of a chimpanzee, for example, or a gorilla, it has this sort of sloping, slow sloping uh, bend to it. It's like a J. It looks like a capital J, uh, but, it, but even a gentle sloping J. And when we wanted to sort of stiffen the back and walk more upright, rather than straightening it out, we just introduced another curve. So we have an S-shaped back. So we threw this curve into our lower back. And part of that was to accommodate how the organs were going to attach and to make room. There's some reasons why it didn't just straighten out, but it did cause a a tremendous new point of weakness. And the cartilaginous discs in between each vertebra can now slip out of place much more easily because of that that bend. So if you can can just picture uh, like a stack of pancakes, but it's curved, it's really easy for the, the little discs of cartilage in between to slip out of place when they're undergoing a uh, strain. And that's what happens. That's a herniated disc, a slip disc. And that does not happen in the other apes. It's never been documented in a chimpanzee or gorilla to have a slip disc uh, because their back is optimal for their posture. But our back is sort of okay. <laughs> it allows us yeah. to stand up right, but it has a number of, of, of weaknesses. So y- this can also affect our knees, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the big problem with our knees is that if you look at how a, a gorilla or a chimpanzee walks, a lot of times um, their legs are bowed and they're slightly bent. And that means that the muscles are doing a lot of work, uh, even just in a, in a resting state. And whereas when we stood upright, we're now putting the burden of our weight on just two limbs instead of four. And to compensate so that the muscles aren't doing all this work all the time, we straightened our legs. So we stand with a straight leg posture much more often than the other apes do, which means that our bones are bearing much more of the weight than our muscles. And a lot of, uh, you know, of the anatomy evolved to accommodate this, but the, there at least one piece, well, there's two that I can think of, but one that definitely didn't really fully optimize for this is the anterior cruciate ligament, which is right behind your kneecap. And it's the primary, not the only, but the primary ligament that holds the upper and the lower leg together. And that's the ACL, as you know. And so anytime you change directions or your, 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 your weight, your momentum changes quickly, if you straighten your leg when you do that, the ACL is bearing the full f- brunt of that change in momentum, the full force. And it just simply isn't up to the task. It is a very thin uh, ligament compared to the job it's supposed to do. And it's, it's not up for it because it was in evolutionary lineage, it was, that burden was shared by the muscles and, and four limbs and it was spread more evenly. And now we have this little ligament that's doing all the work. And there's no way to get it stronger through exercise. You can't like go to the gym and work out your ACL. There's just no way to do that. And so what you have to do is hope for the best and try to not let your legs lock when you, when you change directions like that. But if you do, and the other problem, of course, is that our athletes are getting larger and larger and larger. If you look at the, the average weight of some of these linemen, for example, I mean, it's, they're just massive individuals who are moving <laughs> way faster than I ever could. And 
you know, if they want to change direction quickly, that poor little ACL just snaps. And there's no way to fix it except for surgery. Evolution, keeping our orthopedic surgeons in business. Oh, definitely. <laughs> and I mean, I've had, I had surgery myself uh, on my ankle when I was in high school. And it's one of these things I think about a lot that if I had been born just 150 years earlier, I'm not talking about Stone Age, I'm talking about 19th century, um, I would have been a cripple for life. I would never have, have walked uh, normally again. I had a bimalleolar fracture and that had to be Ooh. surgically repaired. Ooh. And simple surgery nowadays, um, you know, I was in a cast, I was young, so the cast was, I think, about eight weeks and full recovery, full range of motion. You know, I was playing soccer within six months. It's totally fine, but I would never have walked again, or at least not normally because of that. My daughter broke her arm uh, last week. She didn't need surgery, but it needed to be set. And um, I just wonder, just just a few hundred years ago, um, if she would have been a cripple for life. I don't know. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, and the amount that our knowledge has increased, just, it, it's incredible. It's astronomical. Yeah. Yeah. So I it's, think it's, it's a, take it for granted. But, you know, there's so much that we're down about the modern world. And, and we were talking about diets and things like this, that we forget that the prehistoric world in some ways, we, would, we were living in better harmonies with our body, but there was really nothing in the way of intervention when something yeah, went if wrong. Something, if something went wrong, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we lived in harmony, fine, but as soon as something goes wrong, that's yeah. it. Yeah, I, I think about yeah. that with childbirth all the time. And they're like, well, women were doing it naturally for millions of years. Well, and they were, and, and 80% of the time, it went, it went well. <laughs> if you're fine with a 20% mortality... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that that's that would be. Yeah, tragic. I don't think that women should give birth in hospitals because it's required for every birth. I think it's because the chance of going wrong is high enough that you would really be mad at yourself if you tried to do it at home and something went wrong. Yeah, it's just, it's 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 nice to have that. Yeah, it goes smoothly most of the time, but when it doesn't, and it tends to not. When things go wrong, they go wrong fast. So. They go wrong fast, and a quick intervention can. Save, Save mom and baby. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. actually, let's let's talk about that. If you, I'm not sure if you have time, but uh, yeah. the OBGYN section of your book with, had had a lot of great information in it. So the the inefficiency. Let's just before we get to childbirth, let's talk about the inefficiency of human reproduction. Right. Yeah. And we're seeing that more and more in the modern world. Why is it so hard? Why do we Why do we have? You know, the, I feel like every family has a story of difficulty conceiving of miscarriage yeah. of stillbirth of like there's there's you, you either it's either happened to you or you know someone that that it's happened to why are we so inefficient at reproduction it's remarkable for a lot of ways and, and people think this is silly to talk about us being inefficient reproducers considering that there's like seven billion of us on the planet now but you have to remember how recent that population boom really is and in fact we were thin on the ground uh, for most of our existence and in fact our closest relatives all, all um, went extinct. So uh, our success was by no means a uh, foregone conclusion. But anyway, the efficiency is really- It's still, every, it's still not. It's right. every step of the way. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. But every step of the way, when it comes to reproduction, uh, we have inefficiencies. And many of them, we, we don't even share with our close relatives. So for example, we mature very late compared to other animals. So we, we reach reproductive age several years later than the, than the other African apes who have similar lifespans to us. And that creates a lot of inefficiency in terms of evolution because it's a lot more chances that you might not live long enough to reproduce. So just that in and of itself is strange and really calls out for an explanation. And then how many people have trouble making uh, gametes that are, that are um, viable and successful is, is really high too. Now that, that rate might not be so different from other animals, but the reasons behind it to me are, are, are remarkable. I mean, something like 40% of conception events fail to implant for some reason or another. And, and I think that 40% is probably an underestimate, but that's, that's what we, it's the best we can do. 40% of, of successful sperm and egg union <laughs> uh, result in a failure to implant. Now, a lot of those are chromosomal abnormalities. Others, we just don't know why failure to implant itself could be the problem. We don't really know, but there's just a lot of embryos that just don't take, that aren't successfully formed or, 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 or don't get the signals out to stop menstruation in enough time. We don't really know. And that's why drugs can really tweak this up just a little bit when it, when it comes to the implantation event itself. Um, and that's just about it. Uh, there's no drugs that help with chromosomal abnormalities, for example. Um, 
The other thing that's, that's sort of weird for us is that childbirth is so difficult in humans compared to other species. I mean, if you've ever been on a farm, I mean, most of these animals just sort of barely notice when they give birth. It's, it's really, and, and uh, the infants kind of shake themselves off and they're often on their way. Uh, there's a video you can find on YouTube of a gorilla giving birth and she is eating. She's continuing to care for other children. Um, it's, it, it, it's like she barely notices. It's not a dramatic affair at all. And that's nothing like what we know uh, human, uh, human mothers experience. And of course, the obvious explanation is that our, uh, our heads are massive. And so our cranium grew so much uh, over the last, really the last million years, uh, sorry, two million years. And it got to this point where we are born too early. That's really what's going on. So evolution is, is pulling on both ends of this rope because a big, a big brain is great. It's good for us and it allows us to do all kinds of clever things, but it also makes it harder for childbirth. And so this sort of uh, tug of war between the two, the compromise that was made was that we are born at least, I would say, two or three months early. Uh, it's interesting we're because we, you know, we, have, we have three kids and they refer to the first three months of life as the fourth trimester. Exactly. That's the best way to think of it. Yeah, we, we're not and fully... it uh, makes sense. Yeah. But if we wait any longer, uh, you know, maternal mortality would be unacceptably high for the species. So that's sort of the compromise. And it's not just the big brain, by the way. We also have a fairly narrow pelvis. And that's because as we transition to upright rocking, uh, we actually narrowed the bottom part of the pelvis in order to so that our legs can go straight down. Because if you watch a chimpanzee walk, for example, they can walk on two legs, but they sort of swing their legs outwards because their their legs go much more out and then down. Whereas our legs go straight down so that we can stride in a smooth way. Our center of gravity does not bounce back and forth from the left and the right as we walk. It's it's, it's kind of remarkable. But to really accomplish that, you need your your legs to be close together. And so, but that transition happened two to three million years before the expansion of the brain, right? So th those events were not connected. Evolution doesn't think ahead. So by bringing our legs close together, it was great for walking, but it also put constraints on how big the head could get millions of years later. And so when that expansion finally happened, we were fully committed to upright walking, and now we had this big brain. So what was the compromise? We're just born too early, and our infants are incredibly incapable. Um, it, again, if you look at other animals, the infants are much more independent, even in the other apes. Now, the other apes, they nurse and, and the, the, you know, the babies are uh, by no means independent, uh, but they're more successful than our infants are. Okay, so it's not just my kids. No, no, it's not just your kids, really. <laughs> and, and, and I think you'll find, how old is your oldest? Three and a half. I think you'll find uh, he or she is still pretty dependent. <laughs> yes, yes. If we put him out in the wild, he'd be in trouble. Yes. Yeah, and uh, and that's that's sort of the theme of human biology in the sense that our bodies just really cannot make it on their own, right? We survive through our cultural status, right? So we help each other, we take care of one another, not just kin, but we we take care of one another, we pay people to take care of our kids when we can't, and we solve problems with our brains instead of our bodies. And so the result of that has been a lessening pressure on our bodies to to navigate the world on their own. We really are our um, cultural evolution has taken over for biological evolution. And this goes back several million years. I don't, I don't just mean since farming. I mean, um, we've been taking care of each other for a very long time. And what that allows is the cultural drive to collect information, to have skills that are taught, not just learned, but taught. We're the only species that really teaches. Everybody, every species learns, but we teach intentionally. And that's been going on for a long time. And I think that the lesson of that is a happy one. So our bodies are kind of, are kind of crappy. Um, but the reason is because we don't need them to be perfect anymore. We really, we really are solving our problems other ways. So I, I, that's why I like to say that the theme of my book is actually pretty happy. It's pretty uplifting in the sense that aren't you glad you don't have to solve the problems with your bodies anymore? Well, I am. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, my ankle is a perfect, perfect example, right? This would have been a, a life altering injury and it's just not anymore. Cultural yeah. evolution provided us the tools to fix broken ankles so that we don't have to, to try to heal them through, you know, biological means. No, we heal them through technological means. And, and like my vision was terrible, absolutely terrible. Part of that is the way we live now. We can talk about that if you want. But I had like 2450, you know, I had these minus 4.5 lenses. But with the advance of, the, of this book, I paid a, a surgeon to shoot lasers in my eyes and now I see perfectly. So 
And we just keep solving all of the deficits of our bodies by using our brains or other people's brains. And I think that's a good thing. So another thing that you that you discuss in that reproductive section section of your book is uh, the C-section. And, and mm-hmm. I thought that was really interesting that the C-section is is just much, much older than I than I ever thought it was. Yeah, yeah. I think that people have been slicing into uh, mothers in, in, in uh, distress for a long time. And I think it, so there were, you know, ancient Roman tales of it. And part of the, the there was some, you know, of course, lore about it and supernatural beliefs about this, that, and the other. And it became a public health policy around these fetuses and so forth. But I think there was a long been the recognition that particularly during breach delivery, which you can... You can feel, you can you can tell when a baby's in uh, in the breech position, that the success rate of just a regular vaginal delivery was so low that it was worth the risk of opening up her abdomen, knowing that she probably wasn't going to make it, but the baby could, and, and the baby probably would in, in that case. And then with the mother, you sew her up and hope for the best. But I mean, it, it's it's called the cesarean <laughs> for a reason. It really does. I don't think that Julius Caesar was delivered that way, but it does go back to Roman times. And it's also been documented in other cultures as well, because it's not rocket science in the sense that you sense through your feeling, through your hands, excuse me, your tactile senses that this baby is not in the right position. And every other time that's happened, you know, it's been unsuccessful and we lose both. What, you know, what else do we have? What else can we do with the tools around, but get a sharp stone and do our best? Right. Um, There's that learning and teaching and that institutional memory. Exactly. You, You have the knowledge and it passes on and, um, but the idea that a woman would die in childbirth was also not altogether, uh, you know, unusual. Um, that would have been, you know, just part of the the expectations that, that a certain number of the women don't survive. And so, well, she might not make it anyway. We might be able to save the baby. Let's slice her open and hope for the best. And so I think that that practice, uh, I think it's overdone now. I think you probably agree that we probably do a little, a little too many of them. I also am not a big fan of induction, but we can, that might be a conversation for another day. But the point here is that it is an ancient practice and it, it's worked and it's been in response to the fact that we have this huge head. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather not just lacking any expertise in in that area. I definitely, I'm, I'm not going to uh, criticize my OBGYN colleagues with, with regards to the frequency of the C-section or induction because they're they're definitely working with much, much more information, much more of that institutional memory. Uh, sure. But you, you're I have. certainly aware that our the, the infant mortality rates in the United States are the highest in the industrialized world. I mean, we're yeah, yeah, and and so it's some combination of factors. And I don't blame the doctors at all. I actually blame a lot of the legal culture around healthcare in this country for a fair number of, fair amount of it. But I do agree with you in the sense that there, we don't have the information we need to really know what's going on there. Well, there's also you know there it's it's higher in some populations than others. So it's mm-hmm. much higher in, in African American women than mm-hmm. it is in white women. So there there. There are a lot of factors at play here. Uh, than yeah, I mean, the, the tragedy yeah. uh, in this country is that that we do treat populations differently. And s- some of that provides for a natural experiment. But the problem is there's so many confounding variables. And unfortunately, in this country, race and wealth are so tied that you can't know, um, you know what's at play in most cases. I mean, you really have to bear down on the data to separate socioeconomic status from race. And... And but we do have the natural experiment of if we just consider wealthier populations and compare them to you know say Canada and other uh, the UK with otherwise culturally similar populations and we just don't see the rate of infant mortality that that we see in the United States so something's going on yeah I I, I definitely don't disagree with that uh, there were there were two more parts before I let you go there were two more parts of the book that I think bear mentioning and and one we were talking earlier about the inefficiency of human reproduction. Mm-hmm. And one part that plays into that is hidden estrus. Yeah. Right? I don't know when my wife is ovulating. And so, neither does she. And neither, and neither does she. So, I mean, we have an app now, right? Yeah. So that, that can that can help us. But pre-app, right? You just, you know, yeah. you, well, you there's, didn't know. Uh, you, had to just, you had to just keep trying, um, even though that adds to the inefficiency. So what would be the advantage of that? Well, it's a great, it's, this is a great conversation because we really are unusual in our hidden ovulation. I mean, if you, when a chimpanzee is in heat, you know, (laughs) it is visibly conspicuous. She knows, everybody knows. And, and that's how it is with, with other mammals is, is ovulation is advertised. And in humans, it is hidden even from the woman herself. And there's a lot of theories about this, but the one that I think holds the most water is that it, it represented this transition 
to this group living, communal living. And it was a trick that women's bodies played on themselves and men to create a family, to, to, to get a man, for, for example, to stick around and to protect his investment and to know, be, be, a, be assured of his paternity. And it was also her way to, to make sure that she got parental investment out of him. So they were both sort of playing, it's, it's sort of this battle of the sexes. And a lot of people would say that the, uh, the concealed ovulation was sort of the first step in that, in creating uh, a nuclear family where the reproductive interests were, uh, they're only aligned um, if, you're, if no one's sure. Uh, and so you had a lot of sex, you had it frequently, that was the only way. And it was essentially mate guarding in a sense, but it was mate guarding in a way that the female has a lot more agency um, over the process. And uh, so I think that's where hidden estrus came from, is this idea of keeping men interested in sticking around and, and protecting their reproductive investment. And then also from the female point of view, getting some parental investment out of dad by allowing him to ensure that it's his biological offspring that he'd be investing into. So it was them sort of finding a way to align their reproductive interests. And I say finding a way, meaning none of this was intentional or conscious. Yeah. Just sort of, yeah. And, it, and it, it, it corresponds well with menopause as well. So from the best we can tell, menopause came, came about sort of right around the same time. And what menopause does is, is it stops reproduction before the end of the lifespan, which is very unusual. All mammals, with a couple of exceptions, reproduce all the way through their lifespan. A, a female can, can reproduce on, in, you know, all the way to the end. And humans can't. They stop at some point. And that was always unusual. You will see this um, presented in a weird way, like, why is she still alive if she's not reproductively capable? Which is, besides being horribly misogynistic, it's also framing it backwards. It's not that she continues to live after she runs out of eggs or whatever. It's that she purposely shuts down reproduction, even though she has life, lots of life left. Yeah, That's it's why did she stop right, right, being exactly. able to reproduce, not why yeah. she's still alive. And thankfully, we've now discovered in, in, two, in two, two species of whales, uh, uh, the pilot whales and the uh, killer whales. And which, why I say this is great is that we can allow, we can study them and we can see how it works in those species and we can extrapolate. So the idea is what it, what it reduces is what we call intergenerational conflict. So when mothers and grandmothers are both reproducing at the same time, their children, and it would be siblings versus aunts and uncles, all that, start competing with each other for attention, for resources, and for investment. And so to a, from a grandmother's point of view, there's nothing to be gained by continuing to have more children that'll just simply compete with her former children and her children's children for limited resources. So instead, her better reproductive strategy is actually to stop reproducing herself and invest all of her resources in her children and her children's children so that they can compete against other grandmother's children. So it's sometimes called the grandmother hypothesis. But it's not just about conflict part is, is what a lot of people miss about this. It's not just about, oh, grandmas can spoil their children and their grandchildren. They could do that anyway. But the reason, the real thing that they're trying to avoid is intergenerational conflict. Because for her, it becomes a zero-sum game to have her children outcompete her grandchildren or vice versa you know, either way, but she's, so if she can invest in their success another way, uh, and it frees her up to do that. And remember right, that grandmothers, grandmothers also have, are, are older by definition. So they have more cultural wisdom. They have more cultural knowledge to share. They are a commodity, a precious resource. And so that, what they are passing on to their children isn't necessarily food, literally food. It's the knowledge of where to find food, how to prepare food and all of that. So it is valuable. It doesn't make sense for her to have a two-year-old when her daughter or son has a two-year-old because then those two-year-olds are going to be competing with each other. And that's what you said is a zero-sum game. So it's better yeah. for her to give more advantage to her grandchild's two-year-old than to have her, you know, next that's right. child. That's right. And, yeah. and, and, and the powerful evidence for this has been found in these uh, killer whales. So if you look at pods of killer whales, for the most part, they are families and they are led by older menopausal females because they know where the seals are. They've, they've fished those routes for, for, for decades and they have all the wisdom and the knowledge. And that's, that's a good lesson for us. You know, we should be, in, we should be electing grandmothers to our, uh, to our highest office in the land, although we had a chance to do that. We, we had an opportunity. Yeah. To take it. <laughs> but it, it just shows that, that actually care for elders really is a cultural phenomenon um, that was born out of their value, their wisdom, their knowledge. They just know more because they've been around. 
And it's not just women. Women seem to be more um, generous with their wisdom and knowledge, but men, we've, we have fossil evidence of older men, really, really old men going all the way to Homo erectus that could not possibly have been physically fit. Um, they must have been a burden on the group physically, but they were kept around and they were aided. People chewed their food for them and so forth because they knew things. And that was valuable to the group. So that's another, I think, uplifting story in my book is that freeing us from just our body being well, it also allows us to live longer in a happy way, in a productive way. You can contribute uh, long after your body has seen its best days. And that's, that's, what, that's what being human is. Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show a second time. Uh, my pleasure. Book, I love it. Human Errors, a panorama of our glitches from pointless bones to broken genes. Really a fantastic read. I really recommend it to all physicians, well, everybody, but certainly physicians, because it really gives us a lot of great perspective, like what we talked about today on, on how we ended up where we are. And, and, and when you're doing, especially if you're doing a surgery, right, everything just kind of makes a bit more sense when, when you're looking at it through this lens. So I really appreciate your taking your time. Thanks for the kind words. It was, it was my pleasure. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.